everybody wants the blessing of the oxen, but nobody wants to shovel what the oxen produces from his rear end. But the truth is, mass has meaning. In fact, in the kingdom of God, your mass is the launching pad for ministry. That's what the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 2, 3 to 6. Listen carefully. All praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is our merciful Father and the source of all comfort. He comforts us in all our troubles so that we can comfort others. Push the pause button on the Word of God right there and consider what God is telling you. He's saying that there's meaning in your mess. When you're in trouble, the comfort you get from God enables you to comfort others. Your mess is a launching pad for ministry. On December 26, 2004, a violent earthquake struck underneath the Indian Ocean off the coast of Indonesia. As the ground shook, a massive column of water erupted into a tsunami that raced towards the shoreline. When the wall of water hit the shore, buildings folded like waste paper. Cars and trees were swept up in the flood and virtually no one caught in the deluge survived. In fact, over 230,000 people were killed from what became the world's deadliest tsunami. The storm left devastation everywhere and turned the beautiful coast of Indonesia into one huge mess. The village of Gampong Pandey was one of the towns devastated by the violent winds and flooding. The mess left by the tsunami was so great, it took years for the people to recover from their loss. But what the villagers didn't know was that the storm that made such a terrible mess also uncovered a vast treasure. You see, years later, a poor woman was digging for oysters uh, in a swamp near Gampong Pande. She was in the mud up to her thighs, digging through the swamp where the storm had hit, when suddenly she came upon a chest half buried in the ground. When she wiped off the mud and pulled out the chest and opened the lid, she discovered it was filled with gold coins, hundreds of coins valued at millions of dollars. The coins dated back to the year 1200 AD. They would belonged to a wealthy ruler and had been buried in his tomb with him when he died. But when the storm swept through the village, the graves had been unearthed and the treasure that had been hiding for years was dislodged. The storm had devastated Gampong Pande, but the storm also brought to the surface vast treasure. And the same thing is true for all of us today. No matter what mess you're facing in life, God is bringing out a treasure. If you'll decide in advance to let God have his way in the storm, he will bring out gold when it's over. He'll give you a miracle in your mess. That's the message God has given to encourage you today in a sermon titled, The Miracle in Your Mess. We're going to discover the powerful truths that will give you hope no matter what mess mess you face. Almighty and everlasting Father, we thank you that no matter the mess in our lives, no matter the storms that we face, no matter the turbulence and the trouble around us, we know that you can work and you will work all things together for good for those who love you and are called according to your purpose. So today we submit to you. We bind every demon spirit of hell coming to deceive or disturb or distract us. And in the name of the Lord Jesus, I lose the power of the Holy Spirit to fill our hearts and minds. Give us revelation. Show us the way out. Show us the miracle in our mess. Show us the message that you're bringing out of the mess. Show us the ministry that you're developing in us because of the storm that we have passed through. We thank you, Lord, that at the end of this message, we will be encouraged. Our hearts will be on fire, and we will be better equipped for your purposes to bring 
your glory to the world. We thank you by faith in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. I want to invite you to take a moment right now. Put your hand on your chest. Join your faith with mine and say after me, Lord Jesus, speak to my heart. Change my life. Manifest your glory in me. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to Truth For Today. It's great to have you here with me today as we conclude our sermon series, Address the Mess. Tell your neighbor, Address the Mess. For the past four weeks, we've been looking at God's Word to discover how to address the mess in our lives. And today, as we wrap up this series, I'm trusting God to encourage you, each and every one of us today, as we learn from His Word how we can receive a miracle in our mess. Now, to help us learn the truth for today, we've prepared sermon notes. We prepare these every week, and they're free of charge. You can download them on my website or my social media pages. Go ahead and take out your notes now and follow along with me as we discover three truths to give you a miracle in your mess. Just say there's a miracle in my mess. At the top of your notes, you'll find our scripture text for today. It's a story found in the Gospel of St. John, chapter 9, verses 1 to 7. Now receive the word of the Lord. As Jesus passed by, he saw a man blind from birth, and his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, It was not that this man sinned or his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day, for night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Having said these things, he spit on the ground and made mud with the saliva. Then he anointed the man's eyes with the mud and said to him, Go, wash in the pool of Siloam, which means sent. So he went and washed and came back seeing. May the Lord bless the reading of his word to your heart today in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Our story begins with a debate. The disciples are having a discussion. They saw a man born blind, and the first thing they want to know is who sinned? Who made this mess? Who's to blame for this mess? And so often that's people's first reaction to a mess. Who caused this? Whose fault is this? And while there's no doubt that a lot of the messes in our lives come from our own bad decisions and mistakes, that's not what Jesus is looking at. That's not what he focuses on. He's not looking at who is to blame. He's looking for the meaning in the mess. And that's your first truth today. There is meaning in your mess. Listen again to Jesus' words in verse 3. It was not that this man sinned or his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. See, the fact is, we look at the mess and all we see is the mess. But when God looks at the mess, he sees more than the mess. He focuses on the meaning in the mess. He's not looking at the messiness of the mess. He's looking at what he can make out of the mess. For the fact is God is in the business of bringing meaning out of mess. That's how our world got started. The Bible says that in the beginning, the earth was a mess. There was no form and it was void. In Genesis 1, 1 and 2, it says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was formless and empty and darkness covered the deep waters and the Spirit of God was hovering over the surface of the waters. And I declare to you today, the Spirit of the living God is hovering over over the surface of your life. But you see, God formed that mess into a beautiful creation. He separated the heaven from the earth. He caused the waters to go away from the dry land. And out of the ground, he brought forth vegetation and fruit and flowers and trees. He created animals and birds and the fish of the sea. God took the empty, formless mess and made it into a beautiful creation. And then he crowned all of your creation with his greatest work, man. But even though man is God's crown jewel of creation, we have to remember something. Man came from 
a mess. Man came from dirt. Man came from the dust of the ground. For Genesis 2, 7 says, Then the Lord God formed the man from the dust of the ground. He breathed the breath of life into the man's nostrils, and the man became a living person. Can you imagine God telling his holy angels, watch this, now I'm going to make uh, my greatest creation of all. The angels were in anticipation. They were eager. They were excited. They came to the edge of heaven. If all of creation so far was just the first act and something better, something greater was coming, what will it look like? The great creator was making his finest work. They all leaned forward to watch. But to their surprise, God picked up mud. Hey, he picked up dirt. And the angels must have gasped. What a shock. If God wanted to make his finest creation, why did he begin with dirt? It was messy, dirty dirt. But I'm here to tell you today, God is in the business uh, of taking dirt and making it shine. He's in the business of turning mud into miracles. God is the God who makes meaning in your mess. If you believe it, say amen. Now let me make it clear. Women are different. They were created differently. Women did not come from mud. Uh, women didn't come from mess like man. After God made man from the mess, he took a rib from the man and formed it into a beautiful beautiful creature called woman. That's why women are more beautiful than men. Man came from raw material, but woman came from finished product. Amen and amen. But whether you're a man or woman, the good news for all of us is this. God is in the business of turning mud into beauty. He's in the business of turning mess into a miracle. For the fact is, mess has meaning. A messy kitchen means that a meal was cooked. If I come home from church and there's a big, huge mess in the kitchen, that's good news. It means my wife cooks something great and I'm going to eat good. In fact, the bigger the mess in the kitchen, the more elaborate the meal. A small mess means I'm likely to get a sandwich. But if there's a big mess, it means I'm going to eat a feast. But if I get home and the kitchen is clean, then I'm in trouble. It means I'm going to the roadside to buy Kofi Broke Man in a polythene bag. Ay! A messy house means children live there. If you're complaining about the mess, what do you want God to do? Take your children back? You may not like the mess, but the mess means there's life. The mess means there's children at home. The mess means a house full of love and laughter and life. A messy workplace means that something is being done. For Proverbs 14, 4 says, Where there are no oxen, the manger is clean, but abundant crops come by the strength of the ox. Everybody wants the blessing of the oxen, but nobody wants to shovel what the ox and produces from his rear end. But the truth is, mess has meaning. In fact, in the kingdom of God, your mess is the launching pad for ministry. That's what the Bible says in 2 Corinthians. All praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is our merciful Father and the source of all comfort. He comforts us in all our troubles so that we can comfort others. Push the pause button on the Word of God right there and and consider what God is telling you. He's saying that there's meaning in your mess. When you're in trouble, the comfort you get from God enables you to comfort others. Your mess is a launching pad for ministry. Then the Bible goes on and says, when they are troubled, we will be able to give them the same comfort God has given us. For the more we suffer for Christ, the more God will shower us with his comfort through Christ. So Paul makes it clear here. The more we suffer a mess, the more we are able to help others in their mess. Our mess is the launching pad for ministry. That's the lesson we can learn from a young lady from South Africa named Gabriela Mogale. Gabriela was raised in such dire poverty that it seemed like her life was doomed to hardship and failure. But God had mercy on Gabriela, and she was given admission to the Collegiate Girls High School in Port Elizabeth. 
Gabriella was determined to make the best use of this opportunity. She remembered where she came from and the people who were still stuck in the mess of poverty back home. So when Gabriella had a chance, uh, she entered a science competition and she chose to design a way to insulate wooden shacks uh, and make them fire resistant. Her project was inspired by the fact that in South Africa, hundreds of wooden shacks where people live burn down every year, causing not only destruction to property, but loss of life as well. And Gabriella's work to find meaning out of her mess paid off. She won a gold medal at her science fair. Her invention has the power to not only save houses, uh, but to save lives as well. As she said herself, Having come from a disadvantaged background, I've always wanted to be that person who's going to change the lives of someone who was like me. Her mess is a launching pad for her ministry. But it's not just true for Gabriella. The same thing is true for all of us. If you never experience a mess, you'll never have a ministry to messy people. And since everyone on earth has a messy background, you'll only have a ministry when you've experienced your own mess. For the truth is, no mess, no ministry. In fact, the worst messes often lead to the most productive ministries. The best worship in the New Testament came from the most messy, sinful woman, a woman who was immoral, a prostitute who had done so much wrong, came to Jesus. She brought an alabaster box filled with costly perfume, and out of her mess came a ministry of worship. For Jesus said, the one who has been forgiven much loves much. Her filthy mess was a launching pad for beautiful worship, and her testimony is recorded in the Bible for us to see. The best preaching in the New Testament came from the person who committed the worst betrayal of Jesus and was still alive. Peter denied the Lord Jesus with cursing. I don't know him, he swore. But out of that mess, God redeemed Peter and raised him up to be a voice who preached and led 3,000 people to Christ on the day of Pentecost. Peter could preach about forgiveness because he had been forgiven. His mess was a launching pad for powerful preaching. The best theology in the New Testament came from the person who was the most deceived by the enemy. In the gospel, Paul was so deceived in his theology, he killed Christians and thought he was serving God. But out of that mess of wrong doctrine, God raised up a man who wrote most of the New Testament epistles. He's the greatest theologian in the church. And Paul could teach truth like no one else because he had experienced so much deception. His mess was a launching pad for glorious revelation. So what will God do with the mess in your life? What will he bring out of your mess? See, here's what you need to understand today. The mess isn't good, but God is good. The mess is messy, but God brings meaning out of the mess. He can use it for good. He can turn it around. He can take your worst failure and build a bright future. He can take your worst mess and make it meaningful. So here's what you need to do right now. See through the mess to find the meaning. See the mess as God at work. Find God's message in the mess. Embrace the meaning of it. For every mess can bring glory to God when we see it through the eyes of faith. Years ago, when I was pastoring a church in Nigeria, I was facing the worst mess of my ministry. I was being attacked by unfaithful pastors. I was being criticized for things I was not guilty of. I was being slandered and betrayed by people I had sacrificed for. I remember feeling so discouraged. Everywhere I looked, there was a mess. Nothing was working out as I had planned and prayed for. 
And in that dark moment, God sent me to visit a pastor friend in Benin City. I'd he-, he had heard about my troubles and the mess our ministry was facing. And when I walked in to see him, he said something I'll never forget. As I walked into his house, his face lit up with a big smile. Hallelujah! He said, now I know you are a real apostle sent from God. Hey! I was confused. I said, what? What are you talking about? Haven't you heard about the mess? Haven't you heard about the trouble? Haven't you heard what we're facing? I don't feel like an apostle of God. I feel like a failure. I feel discouraged by the mess I'm facing. I feel like there must be something wrong with me to be in such a mess. How can you say, now I know you're a real man of God? My pastor friend looked at me and said, Reverend, all true apostles in the Bible faced persecution. All great men of God in history faced opposition. If you were not a man of God, the enemy would not fight you. He would leave you alone. But this mess means that the enemy is afraid of you. This mess means you're doing damage to Satan's kingdom. He's fighting you to try to stop you. But God has something great for you. The mess means God has his hand on your life. And when I saw the meaning in the mess, my heart was encouraged. God gave me strength and grace to go forward when I discovered the meaning in my mess. You know what I find interesting in the story of the blind man? Everybody wanted to condemn him and his family for their mistakes. Everybody wanted to condemn them for their mess. Everybody wanted to fix the blame. So they asked Jesus, who sinned? Was it this man? Was it his parents? Was it his auntie in the village? But Jesus was not there to condemn. He was there to find meaning in the mess. And while others pointed the fingers, Jesus pointed the way. Find the meaning in the mess. While others were eager to blame, Jesus was eager to proclaim. This happened for the glory of God. So hear the word of the Lord to you today. Do not condemn yourself for the mess. If the mess is your fault, call on God and let him turn your mess into a message. If the mess isn't your fault, call on God and let him turn your mess into a message. No matter what, call on God and let him turn your mess into a message. Don't be discouraged because of the mess. There's a meaning in your mess and in your moment of darkness. Know that the Lord is on your side. He loves you. He's ready to stand by you and see you through to bring glory to your story. For God knows we're messy people and he loves us anyway. He knows and remembers where we came from and he has compassion for us. For Psalm 103, 13 to 14 says, the Lord is like a father to his children, tender and compassionate to those who fear him. For he knows how weak we are. He remembers we are only dust. And that brings us to our second truth today. There is mercy in your mess. Somebody shout mercy. Listen to what happens next in our story. After proclaiming that there's meaning in the mess, Jesus proclaims who he is is. He starts teaching the people who he is and why he came. In verse 5 he says, I am the light of the world. Now at first it may seem odd that Jesus would tell a blind man that he's the light. After all, the blind man can't see anything. He can't see the light. But Jesus is introducing us to a truth that we all need in our lives. Whatever we need, Jesus is the answer. Before we receive it, he wants you to know that he has it under control. He's not just fixing the symptoms, he's solving the problem at the source. See, the fact is God doesn't want to leave you in the mess. There's a meaning in the mess, but there's movement in the mess also. And God takes the mess and makes it better. The mess is a launching pad for your ministry, but it's also the launching pad for mercy. And his mercy declares to you today that whatever you need, he is the answer. You don't need to go anywhere else. You don't need to search high and low. Jesus is enough. And his mercy means there's always an answer to your mess. To the man in darkness, 
he is the light. To the brokenhearted, he's the healer. To the despondent, he's joy. To the sinner, he's grace. God has an answer to every mess. For whatever mess you have, Jesus is the answer. For the fact is, God is the great I am. That's what God said about himself in Exodus 3.14. God replied to Moses, I am who I am. Say this to the people of Israel. I am has sent me to you. Can you imagine what Moses must have been thinking? Moses asked God to tell him his name and God says, I am. And Moses must have been waiting. I, I am, I am what? Moses stood waiting. What's, what's the next sentence? What's the next word? I am. I am who? I am what? But the Lord kept silent. He did not limit who he was. He simply said, I am, and left the rest blank. And suddenly, as Moses stood there by the burning bush, he began to realize there's nothing more. That's all there is because that's all we need. God is the great I am. He's the great I am and you can fill in the blank. Whatever you need, whatever you desire, whatever the meaning in your mess is, that's what God is. He's everything you need. He's all you need. That's why Jesus said in John 18, 5 to 6, I am, Jesus said. And as Jesus said, I am, they all drew back and fell to the ground because there's power in the great I am. In Mark 14, 62, when the high priest asked him, are you the Messiah, the son of the blessed one? Jesus answered, I am. And he says to you today, I am. I am all you need. To the hungry, he says, I'm the bread of life. To those who are trapped, he says, I'm the door. To the lonely, he says, I'm the good shepherd. To the lost, he says, I am the way. To the confused, he said, I am the truth. To the dead, he says, I am the resurrection. To those who've been cut off, he says, I am the vine. To the sinner, he says, I am the Messiah. To the doubtful, he says, I am willing. To the fearful, he says, I am here. And God says to you today, whatever you need, I am. That's the mercy of God. Whatever we need, he is. And the fact is, we all need God's mercy. Whatever you need, God's mercy will meet that need. If you're desperate and hopeless, you need God's mercy. That's certainly what Hiromitsu Shinkawa would tell you if he were here. Hiromitsu was in his house on Friday, March 11, 2011, when a massive earthquake hit Japan. Suddenly, a mighty tsunami sent a huge flood of water into his home, ripping it from its foundation and sending his house out into the ocean. Hiromitsu grabbed a piece of his roof and got up on top of it and was able to float out to sea. But hours turned to days and there was no rescue in sight. Hiromitsu was sitting on top of his roof, floating in the ocean with debris and dead bodies and turbulence all around him. Several times as Hiromitsu drifted in the open sea, he would see a ship and wave and shout, help me, help me. Sometimes he would see a helicopter and he would wave and shout, help me, help me. But though he shouted and waved, no one ever saw him floating on his roof in the ocean. Hiromitsu lost hope and began to prepare for his death, when miraculously, at the last moment, he was rescued and delivered. God showed him mercy. The desperate and the hopeless need mercy. If you're doomed and condemned, you need God's mercy. That's what happened to my friend, Steve Harrison. Steve is an old friend of mine. He was a missionary to Mexico. He was driving along the road one day when he was stopped by a gang of armed rubbers. They brought him out of the car. They pointed their guns at his head and told him, we are going to kill you today. Steve was doomed and could only pray for God's mercy. Suddenly, without any explanation, one of the gang members stood up and said, stop, don't kill him. I perceive God's hand is upon him. Before anyone could say anything, the gang got back in their vehicles and drove away without firing a shot. Hardened criminals showed Steve Harrison mercy because the doomed and condemned find mercy in God. If you've been rejected, if you failed, you need God's mercy. 
I can tell you that. When I was younger, before I entered the ministry, I needed a job. I went for an interview. But before the interview was even over, the lady giving the interview was shaking her head. No, no. I was still talking. She was saying, no, no. I, I was rejected. But for some unknown reason, the same woman who said no called me a few days later and offered me the job. I received mercy. Does anybody here today need mercy? Maybe you're desperate and hopeless. Maybe you feel like Hiramitsu Shinkawa, lost at sea, drifting towards death, overlooked and unrecognized. You need mercy to be rescued. Maybe you're doomed and condemned. The doctor says you have months to live. It's fatal. There's no cure. The judge says you're guilty. You need mercy. Maybe you're rejected and you failed. You're divorced, abandoned, cast aside. You need mercy. If we're honest today, we all need mercy. For you see, we've all been lost. We've all been doomed. We've all failed. But that's just the type of person that mercy comes to find. For God is the God of mercy. For Psalm 86.15 says, But you, O Lord, are a God of compassion and mercy, slow to get angry and filled with unfailing love and faithfulness. His mercy is everlasting. He never tires of forgiving us. He longs to bring us back and restore us to our fortunes. Uh, he longs to bring us near to him. God is in the business of showing mercy to the lost, to the condemned, to the broken, to the weary, to the desperate, to the overlooked, to the doomed and the failed, to the rejected, and to those who've messed up, God offers mercy. And even if the mountains are removed, and even if the oceans dry up, and even if the sun stops shining, and even if the wind stops blowing, and even if the waves stop rolling, God will never stop showing mercy. For Isaiah 54.10 says, For the mountains may move and the hills disappear, but even then my faithful love will remain. My covenant of blessing will never be broken, says the Lord who has mercy on you. And he's proven it to us by coming to suffer in our place. It's his mercy that brought him down to earth in person to redeem us. Because of our suffering, he suffered in our place. For Isaiah 63, 8 and 9 says, He said they are my very own people, and he became their savior. In all their suffering, he also suffered, and he personally rescued them. In his love and mercy, he redeemed them. He lifted them up and carried them through all the years. And if you're suffering today... For from the mess you're in. You are not alone. You may feel as if no one understands your pain. You may feel as if there's no one who can possibly understand what you're passing through. But I'm here to tell you Jesus knows. Jesus feels your pain. Jesus understands your suffering. He bore your burden because he cares for you and he's personally coming to rescue you and redeem you and carry you through these years. If you believe it, say amen. That's what he did on Calvary. That's what he's doing today. His mercy is here. And to anyone and everyone today who cries out for mercy, Jesus will show you mercy. For in Luke 1, 49 to 50, the Bible says, for the mighty one is holy and he has done great things for me. He shows mercy from generation to generation to all who fear him. So Hebrews 4.16 tells us, so let us come boldly to the throne of our gracious God. There we will receive his mercy and we will find grace to help us when we need it most. You may be in a mess because you messed up, but mercy has the answer. You may be in a mess because your parents messed up, but mercy has the answer. You may be in a mess because your husband or wife messed up, but mercy has the answer. No matter the source of the mess, mercy is the answer to our mess. God's mercy is here. God's mercy is available. If you will cry out to God today, he'll give you meaning in your mess. He'll give you mercy in your mess. He will pardon you. He will bring a miracle in your mess. And that's our third truth today. There is a miracle in your mess. Just put your hand on your chest and say, there's a miracle in my mess. 
Listen to what happened next in John 9, 6 to 7. The Bible says, Jesus spat on the ground, made some mud with the saliva, and put it on the man's eyes. Go, he told him, wash in the pool of Siloam. This word means sent. So the man went and washed and came home seeing. Jesus spat in the dirt and put mud on the man's eyes. That's not what the man was expecting. Imagine the blind man suddenly he hears the sound of spitting. <laughs> then the next thing he knows, he feels something warm and messy on his face. Hey! Why not just speak the word? Why not just wave your hand, Jesus, and heal him? But there was great symbolism in this act. The water represents God's presence. Throughout the Bible, water represents life. Listen to John 4, 13 to 14. Jesus answered, whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. And throughout the Bible, water represents the spirit. In John 7, 37 to 39, Jesus stood and shouted to the crowds, anyone who is thirsty, may come to me. Anyone who believes in me may come and drink. For the scriptures declare, rivers of living water will flow from his heart. When he said living water, he was speaking of the spirit who would be given to everyone believing in him. So the water represents the spirit, and the water represents life, and dirt represents man. And when Jesus spat the saliva, the water from his mouth on the dirt, it symbolizes his presence on us. So there's the meaning in what Jesus did. The water represents the presence of God. The mud represents your mess. And here's the good news for you. When the water meets the mud, miracle power is released. When the presence of God meets your mess, miracle power is released. God sent me here to tell you today, there's a miracle in your mess. If you'll get into God's presence, then miracle power will flow. If you'll bring your mess to God, he will work a miracle. I know this for a fact because that's what happened to me. When I was five years old, I had to go to the hospital the doctor said I needed a tonsillectomy. They had to do surgery to remove uh, my tonsils because they were getting infected. So they wanted to op operate on my throat and pull out the tonsils. And normally, this is a simple procedure performed tens of thousands of times a year on small children. But in my case, something went wrong. The doctor cut too deep and the wound started to bleed. Later on, we found out that the doctor who operated on me had been drinking before he came to the theater, and the mess in his life nearly led to my death. I made it out of surgery, but soon I started bleeding. My situation became serious. I was bleeding all over, and they couldn't stop it. It looked like my life might end at the age of five. At the very least, it looked like my voice could be affected by the damage the doctor had done. My mother sat in that hospital room by my bed, praying. She cried out for mercy. She begged God to spare my life. And in the midnight hour, when there was no way out of the mess, God had mercy and gave me a miracle. Jesus walked into my hospital room, and he healed me. The bleeding stopped. My life was spared. My voice was okay. God gave me a miracle in my mess. And the voice speaking to you today is proof that in our darkest hour, God has mercy and moves miraculously. If you can hear my voice today, it is a witness and a testimony to you right now that there's a miracle in your mess. Maybe somebody cut you. Maybe it went deep. Maybe they wounded you. Maybe somebody was careless or reckless or hard-hearted. Maybe somebody did something to you and now you're bleeding all over. He won't make it through, they say. She'll never survive, they say. But God says, listen, the voice you hear right now is proof to you that there's mercy in your mess. No matter what anybody did to you, 
No one is greater than God. God has the final say in your life. Not man, not the devil, not your family, not your professor, not your ex-husband. Only God has the final say. And he says to you, your mess has meaning. Your mess is the launching pad for ministry. The very thing the devil tried to cut off in my life is the very thing God is using now, my voice. And God says to you, there's mercy in your mess. When men hurt you, God heals you. When men wrong you, God makes it right. And God says to you today, there's a miracle in your mess. For he is the mess fixer, the problem solver, the miracle worker, the way maker. He's Jesus. He brings the water out of his presence into our muddy lives and makes a miracle in your mess. So why not trust him right now? Why not call on him right now? Why not turn to him and put your faith in him and let him address the mess in your life? He can heal the hurt. He can break the chain. He can make the way. He can give you life. He can open the blind eye. He can open the closed door. He can open the hard heart. He can open the heavens and pour out a miracle in your mess. Lives will be transformed right now. Bodies are being healed right now. Broken hearts are being restored with one touch of His mercy. Problems are being solved with one moment in His presence. And every mess in your life can be cleaned up, fixed up, picked up, and covered up with one touch from God. For Ezekiel 47, 1-12 says, I saw water the water of life coming out from the temple where the river flows everything will live and there's a river of life coming to you right now i loose the river of god it's a river of healing a river of restoration a river of life wherever that life giving river flows it heals and restores come to the river today just lift up your hands and say jesus show me the meaning in my mess Show me mercy in my mess. Give me a miracle in my mess. In Jesus' name, amen. Welcome to Agape Bible College, a dynamic institution dedicated to training pastors and equipping them for impactful ministry. What's more, it's totally free to qualified candidates. Join us on a journey of transformation and empowerment. At Agape Bible College, we believe in the power of structured routines and spiritual disciplines to strengthen our students' relationship with God in order to be prepared for effective ministry. Our day starts bright and early with students reporting to the ABC premises by 8 a.m. ready to dive into a day filled with purpose. From 9 a.m. to 10 a.m., we prioritize the spiritual foundation of the students through an hour of dedicated prayer seeking God's guidance and seeking his heart for the day ahead. The students engage in active classes held by Lucent University, a fully accredited seminary university. These classes cover a wide range of theological and practical ministry subjects. In addition to this, students spend this time studying other appropriate books such as the Minister's Instruction Manual, MIM. But the learning doesn't just stop there. Students have the opportunity to put their knowledge into action through the various ministry assignments. Some are assigned to the various campuses that the church ministers at, where they impact lives of students at these prestigious universities, fostering spiritual growth and facilitating meaningful connections, as well as coordinating their movements for church services. Intercessory prayer is another vital aspect of the training, where the pastors in training spend a dedicated time interceding for the church and for the nations. Students also have the opportunity to meet with the senior pastor where they get to communicate with him and learn a lot from his experience in the ministry. You see, Agape Bible College is not just a place of learning, but a launching pad for passionate, well-equipped pastors who are ready to impact the world for Christ. The school is looking for people who genuinely have a call from God. We believe that education is important, but we believe that it should be grounded in faith. For this reason, we are looking for people who are seeking to pursue certificate program, diploma program, bachelor's degree program, and master's program. We are looking for you. Join us on this transformative journey at Agape Bible College. To learn more about the Agape Bible College, you can complete an online form at www.agapebcs.org. You may also call or WhatsApp us at 233-243-500242. 
Don't delay. Apply today.